Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Chasen. I'm the CEO of a local Raleigh uh, drone technology company, Precision Hawk. We provide commercial drone solutions to companies and businesses that want to deploy this new advanced technology. Um, you know, up until uh, about a year ago, really, companies couldn't use drones. Uh, individuals could use drones, and the military could use drones. But companies were prohibited from deploying this type of technology. All that changed just 12 months ago when the FAA came out with something called Part 107 that set a, a, a series of rules and regulations that companies could follow if they wanted to deploy drone technology. And uh, that caused Precision Hawk's uh, inbound leads to increase over 300%. Uh, we are now serving clients such as uh, Syngenta to Exxon, large corporations, as well as uh, smaller individuals, uh, farmers, uh, people in construction, uh, insurance agents, all now can use drone technology to fundamentally improve the way that they're doing business. And Precision Hawk is the leader in providing those solutions to businesses. Uh, I joined the company in January, so just after this fundamental change in policy had taken place to help put in place the infrastructure to help this company become, we think, the, the, the billion dollar uh, Raleigh-based technology company uh, that we think it has the potential to achieve. Now, uh, this isn't my first technology company. Uh, as you heard in that brief uh, intro, uh, previously I was the co-founder and CEO of a, a large e-learning software company, Blackboard. Um, if you go back to school nowadays, uh, you uh, might uh, register for classes online. You might take tests or quizzes online. Uh, you would communicate with your fellow students and teachers online. There'd be an online component to your traditional class experience. Uh, some schools even use the technology to bring their entire uh, course or program or degree online. Uh, I helped invent that technology that ended up being used in thousands of schools around the world. And I had the opportunity to be there from the very beginning of that company's creation till eventually where uh, the company ended up being worth almost $2 billion. And there were many, many things that I learned along the way. But the interesting thing is that there were five pieces of uh, what I call unconventional wisdom that uh, I, I ended up uh, experiencing and learning about in the first year of creating the company, but yet they continued to reappear as the company went through the different stages of growth until we became this, this global leader in education. So I, I thought to save all of you the trouble of having to start your own billion dollar company to learn these things, I would just share them with you uh, here today. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is the five pieces of unconventional wisdom I learned when building a two billion dollar company. So uh, I, I told you a little bit about the, the technology of, of what Blackboard did, but uh, it started the company. This was in the first internet boom back in uh, 1997. Um, uh, I had previously worked at KPMG Pete Marwick in their higher ed technology consulting group, and we had noticed that schools were spending millions of dollars wiring the dorm room and the classroom to the internet, but yet there was no software that made that useful for teaching and learning. Similarly, a group of students at Cornell University had started working to design some tools that would allow teachers to put their course material online. We ended up uh, getting together in, uh, in uh, late 1997, and uh, suddenly we had a company and we brought to market the very first uh, e-learning system, Blackboard Learn. Uh, at first, it started just as a side project in many schools. Uh, an individual a professor or a head of a department was downloading it and starting to put up their course materials. Uh, but then, just a, a year or two later, we were talking with the presidents of universities, uh, the CIOs, the heads of technology, and they were talking about implementing our technology across their entire education spectrum. We grew very quickly. Uh, from what started with just a, a, a few schools using our technology, suddenly we were having campuses uh, around the globe that were putting teaching and learning online. Uh, we then got so large, we started expanding not just organically, but we acquired a lot of our uh, competitors in the space. So uh, if you went to college or even in K through 12, you uh, might recognize the Blackboard brand, but we also ended up acquiring WebCT, uh, Angel Learning. Um, our K through 12 offering is a product called Edline, and uh, we even started offering an open source solution, Moodle. So all of those maybe brands that you're a school or uh, that you're an alumni of may use today, and all of those are owned and powered by Blackboard. Uh, we then started expanding our product lines. Beyond just putting teaching and learning online, we wanted to help institutions utilize the internet to bring their entire educational process online. Uh, if you have kids in K-12 now and you get a phone call when it's a snow day or 
heavens forbid, uh, there's an accident at the school, your kid is tardy, uh, that's Blackboard technology. We call about half the parents in the United States every single week. Um, if you go back to college nowadays, you'd have a student ID card and your, you, you could uh, use it to not only get in your dorm room and your, and your classroom, but your parents put money on it and spend it around campus. We were one of the top providers of that student security and commerce solution to campuses. Um, if you downloaded Duke Mobile or Stanford Mobile, that mobile app was powered by Blackboard. So we expanded beyond just our initial roots in e-learning and started offering all of these different components that schools could use to bring their full educational process online. And at the end of the day, we were serving over 30,000 institutions around the world, 30 million users on a weekly basis. Over 100 million people that have gone through the educational process have all utilized or touched Blackboard technology. And it was just, it, it was a great experience for me personally because we literally started in a brownstone in downtown DC. It was me and my, my roommate from college. I had gotten my background in computer science, uh, went on to get my MBA. He had got his undergraduate degree in teaching and then uh, got his PhD in education. And so the combination of the understanding of technology and business and education is what really opened us up to this opportunity. We ended up just quitting our jobs, uh, renting a room in uh, Brownstone in downtown DC and, and starting a company. And we grew it from that to a, a company that ended up with 3,000 employees in 20 offices around the world. Uh, it was started with just a handful of clients. As I mentioned, ended up reaching 30,000 institutions, 30 million users on a weekly basis. We started with just a small group of entrepreneurs, a group of people either just out of school or with less than one year work experience. We ended up growing to an organization with multiple divisions. We had over 500 people in sales and marketing, over 400 developers. We ran call centers in Kentucky. We had eight hosting data centers around the world. We started as a company with just a few thousand in revenue, eventually grew to an organization with over 650 million in revenue and over $150 million in profit. And what started as a small private company, we got to grow and take public in 2004, valued at 400 million, before selling a few years later for $1.7 billion to Providence Equity Partners. So a lot of people say, Mike, what an incredible experience. And to be there from day one all the way through this incredible journey and see all of these changes in maturation and the different levels that this company can achieve, how did you help how did you keep all of that in perspective, to, to be there for that entire length of time and see the company change and grow in so many ways, to see an industry evolve like that? I said, there are really two ways. There are two things in particular that helped me keep it in perspective. Uh, one uh, was my mom. Uh, I actually remember uh, the day that we sold Blackboard. Uh, I called my mom on the phone. I said, Mom, can you believe it? This company that I started almost on a lark with my roommate from college, with just the two of us in a brownstone, we grew to have 3,000 employees around the world. What started is just helping teachers put their course material online is fundamentally influencing the way people teach and learn around the world. What started is something part-time that we were eventually quitting our jobs and not even taking a salary for. We grew and we just sold for $1.7 billion. And my mom said, son, that's great, but remember, you're not a doctor. <laughs> so, so Jew, Jewish mother. So, so that was one thing that always kind of helped, helped me keep it in perspective, the constant disappointment of me to my mother. The other thing was just these, these different lessons that are a little long, things that that I, I think were unexpected to me, uh, that maybe you didn't necessarily read in the books on, on how to create a, a company or what it means to be an entrepreneur, that I just experienced over and, and over again. So let me share what a few of those are. So a, a lot of people ask me, they, 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 they say, uh, I, I have the opportunity to go around, I speak with a lot of entrepreneurs, I work with a lot of startup companies, they say, Mike, you know, I'm thinking of creating a company, like what's the most important thing? What industry do you think I should go into? Or where do you think the big opportunity is? And, and I say, look, the most important thing that I can tell you, the number one thing that I learned is, you need to be passionate about whatever You are gonna be fundamentally spending all of your time doing it. So you need to be passionate and you need to care deeply about what you do. And that was great for me because we were, we thought we were fundamentally making a difference in the way people were engaging in teaching and learning. That was such a great, not only vision, but mission for us. 
But the important thing is you need to be passionate about what you're doing, even if others aren't. And let me explain in more detail. Um, you know, it was great being black, the uh, CEO of Blackboard. Uh, people would send us uh, feedback all of the time, directly. They would just email me. Uh, not just the administrators we sold our software to, but uh, teachers and students as well. I, I remember I got this uh, email. It was sent to a CEO at Blackboard.com from uh, uh, Dr. Betty Schiffman, a teacher. Uh, and the subject was Blackboard Learn Release 9.1 Feedback. So we just released our new product. And, and she took the time to send me this email. She said, I found Blackboard Learn Release 9.1 to be a lot easier to work with much more intuitive. I think there's the perception that managing an online course takes a lot of work, but the reality is that instructors are just so much more efficient. We now have the tools to help us manage assignments, test grading, etc. cetera. Uh, Dr. Betty Schiff, an associate professor of English. And that was great. Like, you know, th this is the reason that I started the company, to get this type of feedback, to know that we are making a difference. But then uh, we also received feedback that people weren't as thrilled with what we were doing. Uh, so for example, uh, for example, I received uh, this email, also sent to CEOBlackboard.com from blackboardsucks326 at gmail.com. Uh, the subject, thanks for nothing. And this person wrote, dear Blackboard CEO, I feel I must tell you that your software is ruining the educational experience that students are supposed to have in college. With your built-in plagiarism detection, it's as if teachers no longer trust the students' work with all the tracking built into the system, the teachers can tell exactly when you've read the assignments, thanks for helping take the fun out of college. <laughs> now, look, here's the thing, actually, in, in terms of, when, I, when I explain to people that you need to be passionate about what you do, there are always going to be people that aren't interested in your vision or don't think that the, the, the technology you've developed or the change that you're helping influence is better for them. But it's important not just to to understand their perspective, but then to be able to address it. So when I got an email like this, I said, you know what? I can understand the student's perspective. Maybe we're not doing enough to build in student improvement tools, and maybe we're not doing enough to, to better improve the communication of the trust between the students and the teachers. And we, so we said, okay, for our next release, let's focus on developing those, those student tools. Maybe we've been too focused on the teachers. So even the negative comments you have to take and incorporate into, into that vision. You can't take it personally. You've got to say, how does this feedback improve my drive for what I want to achieve? Although, look, I mean, I've got to be honest with all of you. I mean, I, I don't know what was more upsetting about this email that I got. Uh, the fact that someone wrote, thanks for helping take the fun out of college, or that a fact that apparently Blackboard Sucks 1 through Blackboard Sucks 325 are all taken. <laughs> I don't know what's more upsetting about that. The other thing that I learned so early on, but again, was something that I found repeated itself as we reached each next stage, was the importance of focusing on the business and not the office. And, and, and now let me explain. So as I mentioned, just before starting Blackboard, I was a consultant at KPMG Pete Marwick. This was back when they were a combined big accounting consulting firm. I worked in the downtown DC office, giant marble building that took up a full block, probably 5,000 or more employees just in that one office building. And uh, when we decided to start Blackboard, uh, we, we went to our boss, um, a, a partner, and a good friend named Greg Baroni, and we said, you know what, um, we, we want to leave. We have an entrepreneurial idea. We want to create a startup. And he said, you know what, Mike? I'm a big supporter of entrepreneurs. I think your idea is great. I, I want you to leave and go do this. I support you. I wish I could leave with you and do this, but I'm a, I'm a big partner at the firm. It would be hard for me to do, but I want to help you. So I'll tell you what. Uh, Take your computers, and we had desktop computers at the time. Take your computers, because I know things, it's hard to get started. Take them for a couple weeks or months, just return them. That's how I'm going to contribute to supporting entrepreneurs. I want to help you. I said, that's great. So I remember the day we, uh, we left KPMG, we, we took these rolling chairs, and we put the computers on them, and we're literally wheeling the computers out of the office. Now, of course, the security guard stopped us on the way out. There are multiple security guards. But they said, what are you doing? You can't just wheel computers out of this, this large uh, office building. And we said, oh, no, no, we have permission. And I, I showed him the note that I had from my boss, the partner in charge. He, uh, he called him up. Um, apparently, he used a rotary phone. He called him up uh, to verify that that was true. He, um, uh, of course, it was. They, he then uh, wrote down um, the serial number of all the computers. He photocopied all of our driver's licenses as well. And that was fine. We had permission to, to take the computers. We were stealing the chairs. We got six chairs out of KPMG that day. <laughs> now, 
For those of you that are entrepreneurs but maybe haven't started your own company yet, let me explain. Chairs are expensive. We had maybe $1,000 between the two of us. And when we looked to go, thought, go buy some desks and chairs, chairs like three, $400. So we basically could spend our entire budget on two chairs and not have anything else in the office. Now look, I, I'd like to lie to you right now and tell you that uh, you know, these were the chairs that we got and they were really great. Um, but uh, uh, this was the chair that I got. Um, it's like missing an arm and... Uh, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's now, uh, sadly, 20 years later, I'm still sitting in this chair. I'm pretty sure it's the reason I have back issues, actually. It doesn't, it doesn't recline, really. It doesn't go up and down. But it always reminds me of just, just how scrappy we were in the beginning, uh, that we were literally stealing chairs to get the company started. And the reason that that always stuck with me is because always at every stage of growth, and, and, and especially when you hit these bubbles, I, I remember visiting... Uh, a friend who was starting a, an internet company showed me his incredible office. Had room for 50 or 100 people, cubes everywhere. Great office, had an arcade, ping pong, and everything else. And I, I said, that's great. And he's, how many employees do you have? He's like, we only have like 10 of us now. We're anticipating growing. And they had spent so much time designing this, this perfect office. Of course, when then the funding dried up or when the markets ended up collapsing a little bit, they weren't able to continue to support this, this lavish office they were building out. And they ended up going out of business. And, and I, 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 I've seen this along the way where people actually over-focus in trying to create the, you know, the best company as opposed to, look, I can tell you that at every stage of growth, uh, I've ended up being in an office where people were literally sitting on top of each other because we couldn't afford or we weren't able to, to move into that bigger office yet. I can tell you now at Precision Hawk, we're growing from uh, probably 80 people working out of Raleigh to maybe over 120, and we're jammed in our office as it is. And it's actually just reminiscent of what it was like even doing a startup. And you should feel that way at every stage of the, of the company's growth. And that, to me, is the difference in focusing in the business versus focusing in the office. One of the other things, and, and, and this is even why the, the reason that, I, that I'm here today, you need to be someone who can constantly share the vision but sell the execution of what you are trying to do. You need to not only be passionate about what you're doing, but you need to talk with as many people about it as possible because you never know who is going to help you. You never know the type of feedback that you're going to get. People come to me and say, well, Mike, aren't you worried about talking about your ideas? Like, what if someone steals it? And I always explain, look, if someone's going to steal your idea, then there were no barriers to entry anyway. It's just the opposite. You should be sharing your idea with as many people as possible, getting as much input as possible, but making sure you can execute against that input. Uh, the Carlisle Group was uh, my uh, Series uh, uh, B investor at, uh, at uh, Blackboard. Um, Ended up putting about $10 million in the company. And, and for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the Carlisle Group, they're uh, big in the uh, uh, military industrial complex. They're one of the leading investors in, in, in uh, 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 military companies and military technology. But of course, everyone was getting involved in investing in startups, so they invested in us. And I got invited to their CEO conference in, in Napa. Uh, so I, I got to go uh, my first year of their investment. And I, I remember when I got there, and I, I was probably the, the youngest CEO uh, in their portfolio by, like, let's say, 40 years. And, and I'm sitting in the kickoff meeting. And they're going around in a circle, and everyone's introducing themselves. And the first person gets up, and he says, oh, my name is Bob. Uh, and this is actually during the first uh, Iraq war. So oh, my name's Bob, uh, CEO of this military company. Um, you know the bombs were dropping on uh, Iraq? We make the casings for the bombs that were dropping on Iraq. Uh, the next guy stands up as though, uh, and I'm a CEO of a, a company. You know how um, you can watch the bombs because they have like cameras on them so they can exactly see if they're hitting their target as they fall? We make the cameras for the, for the bombs that we're, we're dropping on Iraq. Third guy stands up and says, you know how there was this great the video that the bomb, actually, the missile actually flew in through a window of a person's house and blew it up? We make the guidance systems that let the bombs with the cameras exactly fly into places to blow them up. And then I said, I go, uh, my name is Michael Chasen um, with Blackboard. Uh, we put courses online. I think I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was going to do for the rest of my time at the Carlisle CEO retreat as uh, people who had a lot more experience than me and were running multi-billion dollar military companies uh, talked about... Uh, 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 the ways in which they're leveraging federal spending and, and money, and I thought, well, this, this has nothing to do with education. But since I was trapped there for three days, and I wasn't a wine connoisseur, and I wasn't playing golf, I just took the time to start speaking with anyone I could, and I started telling them about Blackboard and our technology. 
And uh, we found out that uh, actually a, a lot of these companies have constantly changing rules and regulations. They said, you know what, if we could get out to our workforce, which is tens of thousands of people, about these new rules and regulations, if we could put that online, because we're constantly doing training, that would be a big savings for the company. We ran into actual uh, people from the military and they said, you know what, um, as, as more of our people are being deployed overseas, that we're interrupting their education. If they could actually continue learning online while they're in the field, that would be a great benefit to us. Uh, we met with companies that said, actually, we want to do training for own employees, not just on uh, their existing job, but help them with career paths within the company. So it was after this that I recognized there was a huge opportunity in providing education in the corporate space. We've been so focused on higher ed or K through 12. Uh, we ended up building a business that was doing close to 50 million in revenue. We ended up supplying um, uh, uh, organizations out of Virginia with uh, not only online training, but also uh, allowing the military to let their students keep teaching while they were in the field. So again, in, at a conference that I thought had nothing to do with Blackboard whatsoever, because I pitched the vision, because I was willing to listen and then take in that feedback and figure out how to adjust our go-to-market, we ended up creating a, a huge and very successful profitable line of business for the company. One of the other things, and especially if you're going around and you're pitching, you're talking about the vision of the company that I found so important, is that you need to constantly seek advice, but you need to also make sure you're the expert. Let me explain in a little bit more detail. In our very, very first round of financing, we were going around trying to meet with every single venture capital firm we could meet with. And, and we, we, would, we would sit down and they said, okay, well, Mike, tell me about the business. I said, sure, let, let, let me explain. I came from a, a KPMG Pete Marwick, and we, we noticed that uh, there was a whole opportunity to develop a product that would let uh, institutions, whether it's colleges and universities or K-12, through put their teaching and learning online. And we were going to charge an annual subscription for this product, so they pay us every year. There's only a small amount of services work. You can download the product, uh, get it up and running yourself. Maybe 10% of our revenue would come from some services work that we customize it, but we're going to be a product company. We were developing something that a recurrable revenue stream. We wanted to focus on the technology. The venture capitalists across the table said, Michael, that's ridiculous. First of all, you're in Washington, D.C. It's a services town. You should be building a services organization. That's what Oracle really is. They go and you sell the technology for cheap. You can go and you can build $200 an hour. You pay people $100 an hour. You're getting 100% markup. You can build a huge, great services organization. No one wants to pay a subscription for a product. I am not interested. I kid you not, we drove across town to our next venture capital meeting. We sat down. The venture capitalists across the table said, Mike, tell me about your business. And you guys don't know me, but let me tell you one thing. I am a quick learner. I said, let me explain. I come from KPMG Pete Morrock. We're a services organization. We've identified an opportunity to do huge services work for institutions. What we're going to do is we've built this technology. We're almost going to give it away free, and we're going to pile on top of it a bunch of services work to integrate it. We're going to hire people at $100 an hour, build them out at $200 an hour. That's 100% profit. We're going to be a big, huge, successful services company. And uh, we have the experience to do so. The gentleman across the table said, that's ridiculous. You can't be a services company. In this town, first of all, the services people work for the big, big six consulting firms or are working for the government, so you're not even going to be able to hire them. Second of all, no one wants to pay people just to do services work at $200 an hour. The schools are never going to be able to support that. You're not going to be able to hire anyone. No one's going to pay those bits. Basically, everyone just wants to have software that they can go and buy and have it up and running by yourself. You need to be a product company. We're not interested. Now, I share this story because I'm not saying that you don't have to go out and listen to what all these other people uh, have to say. There's always great people, in fact, even in this room, I'm sure, who give me great advice on what to do today uh, uh, with, with Precision Hawk. And you always want to be out there sharing the vision and getting feedback. But the thing that I notice is, look, if the idea that you have uh, is new, it means a lot of people haven't thought about it before. And either you know enough to believe that you have this great vision that you can execute on, you know, or you don't. So even though you want to go out there looking for advice, like we wrongly uh, did, don't necessarily change what you're doing. Certainly take and incorporate that but make sure that you really know what your opportunity is and, and you stand behind that. So needless to say, uh, neither one of those venture capitalists invested in us, but I can tell you that a decade later, both of them came up to me, remembering our early meetings and said they wish they had invested in Blackboard. And then the last thing that I want to talk about is just the opportunity of disruption. Uh, it's to realize that if you're creating a startup, the opportunity that you're going after is because you believe the technology or your idea is something that can be disruptive to an industry. And disruption does change everything. But then it also changes everything again. 
And this was one of the challenges that, 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 that Blackboard faced. I mean, look, you can, you can take a look at the different industries. You can take a look at the music industry. First, it was obviously Tower Records that were selling uh, uh, records and then CDs and then Napster came on and suddenly all the music was digital and now suddenly you can literally access any music right from your phone. Now you have the television industry, they came out with uh, beating over the air signals, came cable, after that was general video on demand and again now right on your mobile phone you can watch almost any show ever created. Uh, books, you have uh, Barnes & Noble is of course disrupted by Amazon, and maybe Amazon's working to disrupt itself again because they have the, the Kindle, or you can again get any book right on your cell phone. And similarly in education, we have a brick and mortar institutions, they started to put teaching and learning online, but the fundamental question that Blackboard even today is working to address is, okay, what happens next? Now that education is online, does that mean there's gonna be a dismantling of the overall education structure? Does that mean people will be able to take education in more bite-sized components? Are they gonna be able to get education on the smartphone? So the, the, the advantage, the initial disruption of putting all of this material online is how Blackboard was created. But that disruption is actually happening again today, where Blackboard as a company is trying to figure out, okay, well, are we going to be disrupted out of this business, or can we help with this next level of disruption? So you need to recognize that whatever your opportunity is, whatever that disruption that you're causing in the industry that's going to let you create this great company is then disruption that years later is going to apply to you. So I talked about today the, the five pieces of conventional wisdom that I had the opportunity to learn about the way. Uh, being passionate about what you do, even if others aren't. Focusing on the business, not the office. Sharing the vision, but selling the execution. Constantly seeking advice, but being the expert. And recognizing that disruption changes everything, but then it changes everything again. And, and these, uh, many of the stories I shared with you were all the, the first instance that I encountered this this piece of advice, but I can tell you that at every round of financing, at every level of growth of the company, these same themes kept reappearing over and over again. But there was one lesson that I, quite frankly, didn't experience during my time at Blackboard, or, or, or not till the very end. Uh, that last piece of uh, unconventional wisdom is, uh, when you're done, uh, do it all again. So I ended up selling Blackboard uh, for $1.7 billion to Providence Equity Partners, and I stayed on board for a while and then ended up retiring. And uh, I remember my wife was saying to me, uh, honey, uh, you gotta get out of the house, you're driving me crazy, go work on something. I said, I said, first of all, it's Saturday. I just quit yesterday. I'd be home anyways. I don't know what she was complaining about. And uh, I literally took the weekend off and uh, started another company, Social Radar. It was a small tech company. We had some ideas about how to use a, a smartphone and uh, location technology, and um, we ended up figuring out how to get the exact latitude and longitude of every door of every business. I know that sounds a little esoterical, very specific, but actually if you have that piece of information, you can improve location tracking on your smartphone. And Verizon ended up acquiring that technology from me in uh, Q4 of last year. Uh, that's actually how I ended up coming across Precision Hawk. So I was, uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, something called LIDAR, it's laser-based radar. That's how all the uh, autonomous vehicles work. That's how they can sense everything going on around them. And uh, so I, uh, I saw Precision Hawk was this company that had experience flying a drone with LIDAR over city, uh, had drones with LIDAR, so I started looking into it. And uh, it turns out that's illegal to do, and I would have gone to jail for years had I tried flying drones over cities with LIDAR. But nonetheless, I came across this great company, Precision Hawk. And, uh, and then uh, ended up speaking to the team and found out they were looking for a CEO and uh, ended up coming on board very excited. I ended up joining uh, Precision Hawk uh, the day that I ended up selling uh, Social Radar to Verizon. So it was my first day of work at Verizon. I went and I said, I don't think things are working out. And uh, ended up coming on board uh, uh, Precision Hawk. The reason that I like to tell that story is because uh, People that are truly entrepreneurs, uh, I, I think people that truly have the passion to make a difference, to disrupt an industry, to create change, it, it, it's not something that you can just kind of focus on one company to do. And I mean, I've just been at it, I think, longer than many of the people in the room, but I can tell you that it, it, it's a great uh, job opportunity. It's, it's a great life vision. It's a great mission. It's a great thing to be a part of. So I'm incredibly excited to be part of Precision Hawks. I think, wow, here I believe the drones are going to fundamentally change everything. Same way that Blackboard had the opportunity to fundamentally change education as people were using the internet for the first time to put teaching and learning online. Companies deploying drone technology just became legal a year ago. I said, oh my God, of course, this is going to be tremendous change and not just the drone industry, but every industry drones touch. I mean, you may read about the interesting things that Amazon is doing with drone delivery 
or uh, what firefighters are doing uh, deploying drones, or what uh, uh, companies in agriculture, construction uh, companies, or companies in energy have their deploying drone technology to fundamentally gather together information, make better business decisions based on this technology to improve the way that they're doing business. We're a part of that. And I'm excited to be a part of that fundamental industry change that's taking place. So hopefully we've gotten uh, a little bit uh, from all of my experiences, and uh, I, I was glad I had the opportunity to come share them with uh, the, the, the Raleigh entrepreneur and technology community. Uh, I, I'm someone who loves to be actively uh, engaged in the community. So uh, here's my email, my Twitter account, my Instagram, Facebook. If you're uh, part of a company or part of a, an organization that works with startups, please reach out to me if you have questions. I, I, I love giving back. So many people helped me along the way. So many people helped me uh, learn those lessons along the way. I love to be able to connect with other startups in the community and, and, and share my knowledge. So hopefully you gained a little bit about my extra insights. Now you can all go create your own $2 billion companies. And uh, I wish you all good luck. Thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.